It isn't just about protecting you, it's about protecting heroes like we heard speak here earlier this evening from emergency uh, response teams um, in law enforcement, uh, fire departments, and so forth. Uh, first of all, the biggest uh, d d discussion going on in the intelligence community right now is if Al-Qaeda is capable of another large-scale attack like 9-11. This is all the talk in the intelligence communities coast to coast, uh, in the FBI, in the Bureau, in the Homeland Security. And I think at this point the determination has to be that it's not likely. Such a large attack probably isn't likely because the way this attack came about was that Al-Qaeda created the biggest internationally organized terrorist network the world had ever seen by the year 2000. They were in 40 countries. Their main command uh, center location was Afghanistan with similar um, smaller scale uh, leadership uh, command, high command in Pakistan. I can tell you today that 90% of the leadership of Al-Qaeda on 9-11 is no longer on the planet. About 90% has been decimated of the leadership core. Um, the Al-Qaeda that we face today is a different generation. It's not that generation anymore. It is for the first time that I feel comfortable, therefore, also recommending the withdrawal from Afghanistan. There's no one who's been a bigger advocate of us staying the course in Afghanistan because of Al-Qaeda's leadership core there. The killing of bin Laden, the gathering of intelligence information from that mission now, and the lack of individuals to replace him to create a truly global, internationally organized terrorist network means that we can get out of Afghanistan now. Don't mess around with nation building there, but simply use our intelligence community to monitor any potential resurgence of a tele Taliban Al-Qaeda connection. That can be done without having U.S. soldiers in harm's way uh, during, uh, during the need to uh, use our intelligence resources in other ways. Bin Laden's death was the last chapter, therefore, of the 9-11 generation of Al-Qaeda leaders. Without that centralized command structure then, Al-Qaeda's main functions now are in regional places. Al-Qaeda on the Arabian Peninsula, Al-Qaeda in Somalia, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Those are three of the larger groups that function out there. But Al-Qaeda no longer has a central command, and you can commend the sacrifices of many lives of many soldiers, many lives of many persons who have given us intelligence information to accomplish what we've accomplished so far, including individuals in the, the Al-Qaeda structure itself who betrayed bin Laden himself. Many terrorists are like that. When you get them separated from their terrorist organizations and you use effective interrogation techniques, which do not include waterboarding, they usually include using female interrogators, quite frankly. They tend to talk after a while of seeing female interrogators and then they don't show up for a while and they want them back. They also uh, give, have given us tremendous information in the interrogation network by being able to threaten them with either talking to us in one region in Iraq or being sent to Guantanamo. The image being Guantanamo is a place where nasty things happen. I mean, this is the dilemma democracy like ours is in, that we get criticized for using torture, but the fact that we may be using torture is a tool for effective interrogation in other parts of the world because they don't want to go there where we flush Korans cor down the toilet. Uh, so, uh, this is something, though, that many of the folks working in the in, uh, intelligence community, counterterrorism community, have been willing to take as criticism by the international community. The goal is never to take them to Guantanamo at all. The goal is to get individuals to talk in the field, in the environment, so you can act on that intelligence quickly in the environment. This is one of the secrets of the war on terrorism, uh, and uh, it's why, in some cases, we've been so effective. So I want Guantanamo to stay there, and wouldn't you know that the counterterrorism community convinced our current president to leave it there. And here we are, we've completed that. Great, great successes, you know, in, in, in the way this game is played, unfortunately, with despicable people. My goal in all this is, unlike the heroes you heard speak uh, earlier, my goal is to close doors. Their goal is to open doors get people, to help people. 
my goal is to close every possible door of intrusion in this. And the individuals that I work with are uh, the most committed people that I've been around anyway uh, in this profession because of this cause. Consider what they've done. Even when Al-Qaeda was still better organized in the past 10 years, when bin Laden at the helm with tremendous resources before they were disrupted by us taking them away from their resources and banking and criminal activity, Al-Qaeda accomplished three attacks against this country in 10 years. This is after 9-11. They said there are going to be more. There are going to be thousands more people killed, etc. The three attacks, the Times Square bomber, these are the only three organized by Al-Qaeda's Central Command. The Times Square bomber, the shoe bomber, and the underwear bomber. Rather, rather pathetic one. That's it. They weren't individuals? So, no, those, all those individuals had connections to, to Al-Qaeda's Central Command. Only those three had connections. All other attacks, and there have been many others, we can talk a little bit about them if you want to, attempted attacks, were individuals not connected either to the Al-Qaeda network generally or not to the Central Command and weren't planned and organized in uh, Afghanistan or Pakistan. It didn't have those links. So that doesn't mean that we haven't disrupted attempts, but it shows you that Al-Qaeda has never delivered on what they said they were going to do. They've never ignited the um, Muslim community around the world to launch religious war against the Christian communities in the West. Muslim leaders in many countries did not answer the call after 9-11, which was meant to be the lighting of a torch, a very, very uh, important image, a lighting of a torch of a long-scale war, religious conflict with the Western world. So those three attacks therefore tell us that we can look at this tremendous success our country has had, and I, I suspect few of you in here would have believed on 9-11 that this is pretty much what we would be able to contain it to. Uh, to, to, to this point. Europe, India, Iraq, Pakistan have bore a, a, a terrible brunt of terrorist attacks since 9-11. They are the ones who have borne uh, the, the, the most. Cities like London, and you've seen some of the consequences, Madrid, Spain, where there were large-scale attacks. Al-Qaeda's cell in the Caucasus, according to the Russian reports of the, late in the summer, has been disrupted by capturing Al-Qaeda's leadership there that was supporting the war, uh, terrorist uh, attempts, terrorist attacks by Chechen terrorists in Moscow. Many of those you've seen since 9-11. In 2003, 2004, uh, Beslan school attack being the one that uh, you may be familiar with. So while we should respect Al-Qaeda's ability to operate outside of the United States, for inside the United States, therefore, we should remember that at this warning on this anniversary, the best that Al-Qaeda could do, at this point I think we need to have a little swagger. It's, it's, it's definitely time for us to talk a little bit about our accomplishments, not to be on the defensive, but we're finally after 10 years in a position where we can be a bit more offensive and feel very confident about what we've accomplished. The best that Al-Qaeda can do from the intel that we have as of this weekend is to send three people into this country, one or two Americans, there's dispute over this, one a foreign national, inside of this country to see if they can put together a single car bombing. That might, you might say, well, my God, a car bombing. But in the great plans of the Al-Qaeda network, in the Al-Qaeda training manuals that uh, our military forces have confiscated in the environment, of, of conflict in Afghanistan about what they wanted to do. This is not a very impressive planned attack against the United States, which we seem to have already disrupted. They've gone underground, or maybe the intelligence isn't that reliable anyway, and there's really nothing there at all. Keep in mind, during the Iraqi conflict, the average number of car bombs and the high point of it was three a day in Iraq. So this is what has happened to Al-Qaeda since 9-11. Uh, this is the kind of success that our country has had. The story of those individuals will be told. It can't be told tonight, and uh, I don't have enough information to tell some of it, um, but um, that, that story will be told as, as well. A couple of other things here, kind of quickly moving along. 
If Al Qaeda got a t terrorist team into our country, they are in a position that is so defensive that they don't have the luxury of waiting for an anniversary. Traditionally, terrorists wait till anniversaries to attack because they want to remind you of what they can do. They want to rub your anniversary in your face when possible. Al Qaeda is in a position that, that uh, is so defensive that if they can get a group of individuals in here to commit a terrorist attack, they can't wait for an anniversary because they're going to get uncovered. Somebody might give them up. So when I heard the reports and the warnings coming out of the counterterrorism community that the group was here to, uh, to, to commit that act, I, it made me realize that if they haven't committed it by now, and we've got intel that they have, they probably can't even accomplish that. You as personnel, you when you, you when you travel as tourists abroad, are always at risk in the international environment. This is the one thing that the Homeland Security structure is not really good at doing still. We can't protect you when you're traveling abroad. You must look at the State Department warnings on where you're going. You must take into account that there's no reason to travel internationally without a, a cell phone. Just get one. Create a, a check-in routine with somebody back here calling every morning at 9 o'clock our time or something to, to say you're okay. You have to be smart travelers because this is one area where we haven't been as effective. But for the homeland security environment, I think we've crossed a, a, a great uh, rift here of insecurity and we've now closed enough doors that the house is much more secure than it has been during this time. As for the topic of Homeland Security, what stands out for me, therefore, is one of the most important pieces of data. One of the things that I do is I collect information, I read everything. I'm looking for two pieces of information in different parts of the world that somehow connect. The, one of the most important pieces of data for our safety is inside our own country. Since 2001, 164 Muslim Americans have been suspects worthy of investigation for plotting possible attacks against the United States. 164 Muslim Americans. These are not individuals from outside our country. Muslim Americans inside our country. The, the, the big piece of information on this though is that 60, up to 60% of the information law enforcement gets on potential threats in the Muslim American community come from the Muslim American community. The Muslim American community is right with us in our security needs here. 60%. Investigations, 20, 25%, right? Um, Confessions, outright confessions, people confessing they're going to do something, threatening other individuals, etc. And then, of course, there's a percent that we haven't caught people uh, doing this. So, the, 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 there needs, something needs to be understood here, that the Muslim American community at times complains about surveillance, about the, the tension that's going on between them and law enforcement. But despite all that, the Muslim American community is our greatest asset in identifying their sons and daughters who Al-Qaeda may try to reach out to in chat rooms, individuals in their own communities that seem to be radicalized, uh, and uh, the potential, therefore, of, of homegrown terrorism, which I'll talk about here in just uh, a moment. And the other interesting aspect about this, and thank goodness the Department of Homeland Security has talked a bit more to the citizens about this, is that we've closed doors by great sacrifices of American citizens. And I know you all don't like the way the airports work now. Nobody does. Nobody likes your grandmother being a subject of a search. But there's two important issues that require us to stay the course with this and allow this to happen. One is that it isn't about grandma and whether or not grandma looks suspicious. We do those inspections so that the individuals watching us to see where our weaknesses are at our airports and our security know we're going to search every elderly woman like everyone else. And if you try to use elderly women or children to bring in bombs to, to, to commit acts on, on aircraft, they're, they're going to be inspected as well. And we add the other main concern about this and this has been the primary concern in uh, air traffic uh, 
all over Western Europe and the United States, and that is bomb implants. We have six significant examples, in one case, an actual attempted assassination of a high